Vi kör eller? Okej, okay. let's get started. There are still people joining us. So, very welcome to this second webinar from for the project Swedish Medical Language Data Lab. My name is Ulrika Wagren. I'm project manager and business advisor at Salgenska Science Park, a West Sweden-based life science accelerator and science park. Today, you will get to hear about the recent results from deploying AI on real-life patient data and the impact that could have on healthcare. But first, you will get a chance to meet the two celebrities from our sister project, Information Driven Care, and authors of the handbook on the same theme. And learn more about the book and why they decided to write the book in the first place. Actually, this is a sneak peek, as the book is not formally launched until October. Please mute your microphones, but leave your cameras on and use the chat function to ask questions or share comments. There will be a panel session in the end and where we will try to address your questions. So let's get started. And I would like to introduce Marcus Lingman and Kai Andersson. Kai is head of major impact initiatives at AI Sweden and somewhat a guru in the field of AI and advisor of the Wallenberg family a major Swedish industrial owner and research sponsor. Marcus is chief, chief physician and strategist with Region Halland and also appointed adjugated professor of Halmstad University. In 2020, Marcus was named AI Swede of the Year. And I know this is some geeky trivia, but have you noticed that even his initials have an AI vibe? Coincidence or not? Welcome on stage, Marcus and Kai. Thank you very much, Ulrike. Uh, yeah. I'll having the I'm going to have the joy to conduct an interview and a dialogue with Marcus uh, because I, Marcus was, in my opinion, the main initiative taker to write this book and has been the driving force. Even though I've been the editor and written a short chapter, uh, and I've had the joy to try to conduct eleven different authors who all have a great part in writing this book. Uh, and we also have some exciting news, Marcus, uh, that this book would be part of the course literature uh, of the Physicians Program at Karolinska, right? Uh, hopefully. Uh, but I want to start, Marcus, in your words, why did the idea of this book come about? Why do we need such a book? Well, in, in my opinion, the book uh, connects to a larger framework uh, of activities uh, across Sweden, uh, a, a major impact initiative uh, based on the Vinova call Vision Driven Health. And one part of that uh, initiative is actually communication and collaboration. And that's a crucial part, a key to uh, going forward together with a number of stakeholders. And, and what we uh, identified early on was uh, needs to communicate in different ways to different stakeholders with different backgrounds. So uh, what we try to do in this <clears throat> handbook is to basically tell the story of information driven care and its different parts. Uh, because in, in, in information driven care, um, the key is to join forces from different knowledge domains and different data domains uh, for that sake. Uh, and when you, you are supposed to do that, you need to uh, create a common language. So part of the point with the handbook is to create and support that common language between the legal team and the data science team and the management and the clinicians. So, so it's a way of communicating in a way that we hope is uh, accessible to, to a broader audience that need to get a little deeper into subjects that is not uh, their everyday work. 
We wrote in the book, I mean, I think you touched on, on a very important point that information driven care uh, requires a, a change in culture where everyone has to accept that they're part of a, a whole rather than different decentralized speciali speciali specialities. Uh, and that's, I mean, that sounds like a, a big, big change. Uh, and hopefully this handbook can be a part of if everyone can discuss discuss it from different perspectives, almost like a professional book club, <laughs> it can contribute to that. But I mean, you've you've gone through that change part of the journey or a long way of the journey in Holland. Uh, was that painful to you? It would have it would it helped would it have helped to have this book for you when you started? Well, certainly, and that's uh, also how we try to fill it with information that we would have wanted when we started this journey that was actually took place in 2015. So we've been on this route for, for six years uh, by now. And, and transitioning culture is a major challenge, especially when it includes a number of specialties and knowledge domains that usually don't meet. Uh, and, and, but one key notion of information driven care is actually understanding that we are all part of a joint mission to deliver better health. Uh, and, and that it applies to the legal team, the management, certainly the clinicians are used to it, but also data scientists uh, that need to understand that the, uh, the data is not there for its own sake. It's there in order to translate uh, data into information uh, and into new insights, actionable insights uh, that uh, will alter behavior um, so that we can provide better care. So that's, that's the key. And we as a system uh, need to uh, provide better care and more fact-based care. And the fact is hidden in the data. So that's why we embarked on the journey. Something that struck me when we started working together was that uh, compared to the private sector, it seemed like the, your purpose in healthcare was much clearer because after all, it's about providing health to, to citizens and patients. And I think that's also one key message in the book that uh, the, this transition needs to start from the patient need and the future uh, delivery to the patient, not the organization itself. Exactly. And, and that's an error that we sometimes in our cognition do that we are we go to our work and we we have a task and, and we work according to that task but we we don't think beyond that, that task and, and it's important to understand that um, every bit and piece of a healthcare system connected healthcare system uh, is supposed to be there to deliver either longer lives better health or 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 a um, comfort in society knowing that you can get help when you need it and if you don't achieve that with either of the tasks, the millions of tasks we have in healthcare, you should not put your effort into that task. You should do something else. Uh, so uh, what counts is how the patient fares. Uh, and the patient rarely asks us as clinicians, what part of the organization are you in? Or, or how did you pay for this CT scan? they are interested in their health and, and that's how it should be. And that's how we should deliver, uh, not based on where we are uh, in our situation, in our organization or, or what task we have at hand. We need to make sure that it all contributes to the interest of the patients. There's a quote in the book touching, uh, relating to this, and that's, there's a lot of accepted truths or myths in healthcare. Uh, I think that's very telling. I mean, I guess that goes for every organization, but can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Well, yeah, and I think this is actually part of our um, cognitive and, and social biases that we all carry with us, that we have a, a worldview, a, a 
cause and effect, a view of causes and effect that is comfortable uh, to us because we don't need to question them. But when we question them and when we build on fact, we realize that they are not true. And if, if we are acting on, on the biases that we carry with us, we make the wrong decisions in the individual situation, but also on the managerial level. Uh, and uh, so we need to, uh, uh, we, we need to conduct uh, myth busting. Uh, that's part of information driven care. Un uh, questioning the dogmas uh, in healthcare. There are thousands um, that, if if not fact based, they will they will jeopardize either the patient's health or the money that is invested in the healthcare system. One one example uh, that was very clear when when we looked into it early on, this was five years ago or so, uh, we, we looked into the re relationship between the occupancy rate of the in-hospital beds and the chance of being admitted to the hospital. And, and the, the dogma was saying that, well, if there's a high occupancy rate, then there is less chance to be admitted to hospital from the emergency department. Okay. That's what I thought, so let's look into it. And there was no correlation whatsoever. Uh, and, and that is also part of the culture, uh, digging into the data instead of uh, continuing looking at the world, the healthcare, uh, the way we were trained to see it, which is unfortunately not always true. I think you underline one and a very important thing, and that is to dare to challenge the problem rather than just accepting the way we do it all the time. And I think, as you said, there's something that we all humans are guilty of, like just falling into that comfort and accepting the way things are and, and not changing anymore. And I mean, it must be particularly hard for physicians who have invested a decade of <laughs> studies into, oh, now I can, I can stop changing. But how do, you, how do you continue to change? And, I mean, you can't put that responsibility on all every single healthcare professional to just make that transition herself or himself. Who who has the ultimate responsibility in an organization to make that cultural shift? Well, management always has the, the responsibility of, of the organization and its output uh, and how uh, questioning what we do is very a very sensible thing to do. It's hard to do because it's comfortable to be in your comfort zone. Uh, but, and questioning that is not uh, appreciated by all. Uh, but you need to create a leadership where it's okay to question things and ask, are you sure? How do you know that? Uh, and let's look into it now that we have the capabilities, because one thing that we uh, built in this uh, area was the capabilities to understand things based on the data that we collected in the warehouse and also put uh, a, a layer of, of very capable tools on top of it. So that's where we, we uh, came into the AI uh, world to apply more complex and, and multidimensional and nonlinear methods. So uh, it, it's both culture and, and technical at the same time. So would you say that it's crucial uh, for the ability to make this transition that management understands this and takes responsibility for it and not delegates it? If they don't understand it, you should not. You should work somewhere else. I would say um, with these kinds of ambition uh, and uh, a management, a managerial level that is not interested should not be in the management because the train is leaving the station now, or is actually already left the station, and and healthcare, um, the trajectory trajectories in healthcare based on on, on the. Uh, the demographic development and, and, and what we can do for our patient is, is rapidly changing um, uh, the playground for healthcare. And in order to meet this increasing demand with the resources at hand, 
we need to work in other ways. And that's basically the insight that came to us in 2015 and say, we cannot continue with like a more of the same strategy. Uh, we need to do uh, more for not less, but as much as we do now, have now uh, in, in terms of resources. So that's that was actually the paradigm shift that was in the, in our heads and, and and the rest is like history now what do you need to do in order to shift this paradigm across the organization well you need to have politicians on board you need to have the senior management on board you have to have key key individuals on board there are always people in the organization that people other people listen to more uh, and you need to identify those and, and have uh, ambassadors from all all perspectives and one one repeating issue was like for uh, senior clinicians to understand why data scientists needed to, to speak with them that, that was like really uh, and when they did they didn't understand each other anyway so so we needed to uh, translate like using google translate but it was not between english and swedish but uh, rather than uh, legal data and clinician ish i don't know what the language name is but th that the talk of the clinicians another quote from the book is transparency is scary uh, dead bodies or well, skeletons can fall out of the closet and I guess one of the skeletons was the realization that admission and hospital bed occupancy, there was no correlation. But, uh, and I mean, that's uncomfortable and probably a cause for resistance to change for many to, to do something else and just keep discussing things. But does it become easier once you start, once you start to finding skeletons and accepting change? it gets easier when you accept the skeletons because yeah. they're they, they are there so the the senior management needs to to say that because an, an important part of information room care is actually the transparency part understanding what's beyond your own responsible ability borders uh, so you need to uh, show everyone with facts with data what you are doing and how you're providing and you everyone wants to be proud uh, of, of what you do uh, but in in our homes there are always things that we don't show to the public that we don't like it was something that happened and and well we got away with it and it was no big deal but these things can these skeletons can, can come out of the closet uh, once you start talking about all the facts available, all the data available and showing them to everyone. Uh, and that is scary initially. And it's definitely scary if, if the culture is punishment uh, for having those. Uh, but so one important thing is, is to realize that we are all imperfections. Uh, and and we are as clinicians not far, well far from perfect. We can we can't be perfect because we're humans. We cannot be machines, uh, and we don't want to be machines. But but so transparency, showing all these lacks of perfection, is scary initially, but not after a while. Once you uh, the immediate response to the skeleton is, well, let's pick it up and, and work together to, to um, find solutions oh. on how to, to tackle it. I mean, I'm, one of the things I, that impressed me most of your journey is pro probably not that you actually built all this, is that you picked up the phone and called someone abroad in the US and asked for help and guidance, which I think is like ties back to that skeletons or vulnerability to actually dare to collaborate and be work together on things uh, and that ties into a question from Marlin uh, in the chat when w when do you think collaboration with industry is needed uh, I mean because I know you've done this in Holland as well to 
the filling gaps of knowledge and expertise. Absolutely. And we have several uh, companies in the room today that we collaborate with. Uh, and it's all about, well, it's it comes down to uh, utilizing the data, the information in, 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 in patient um, profitable ways. Uh, and in doing that, you need not only data information from all perspectives of healthcare, you also need the competencies from all perspectives of healthcare. And not all competences can be found within your own organization. If you do that, you're, you, you're unique in, 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 in this industry, I, I, I can promise you. So you need to look for, for skills and capacity and competence wherever it can be found. Uh, and sometimes you find it in academia, Sometimes you find it in your own organization, and sometimes you need to collaborate with, with uh, life science industry, pharma industry, um, uh, med tech industry, or wherever you find the skills that are needed. So um, it's important to create a area where that collaboration can take place without being questioned or or or. Uh, being untransparent, uh, so you you need to build trust around these uh, border crossing collaboration, and that's part of of the cultural journey, but also the legal journey. You need to understand how you can do this and tell everyone how it's done in a safe uh, in a safe way. And, and we spent so much time on safe data access, integrity issues, um, data quality, um, who can make money on what? That's a very sensible question and sensitive question uh, in, in, in some areas. So you need to sort all these things out in order to, to make your, your um, uh, different stakeholders feel safe in the area. But it sounds like you have a, a lot of experience and learnings that if you're in another region, uh, I should probably call you first and learn before just invent, reinventing the wheel and doing it yourself. Or maybe read the book because uh, the number of, of talks we give at this <laughs> point is, that cup is pretty full. But uh. Uh, And we are also uh, launching the book as a, uh, a more condensed version, a digital version, uh, where we're actually also using AI and adaptive learning uh, together with Sana Labs. So you will be able to have the contents in your telephone uh, with quizzes after each chapter or section in the book. So that will also be distributed on the fifth when we have a, a longer webinar around the book and a panel discussion. Uh, I want to tie back also to actually the, uh, the Swedish Medical Language Data Lab and the, the context we're in right now uh, and bring you out of your physician's role because I know you have a lot of responsibility in what, what you say. But if you allow yourself to dream like five, 10 years ahead when we have all the infrastructure in place for information driven healthcare uh, and we have a competent language model or a medical language model in production where you, that you can we can use data. What what could you do with that? What's I mean from a from your perspective and maybe from a patient perspective? Well, from a management perspective, a clinical management perspective, this, the sky is basically the limit here. What we have shown that. Uh, is that it is possible to use very advanced models in order to to uh, increase patient safety through through a, a couple of cases and and in five years or or yeah hopefully five years maybe ten but uh, I'm sure that we will have um, real time patient safety or rather healthcare quality uh, monitoring systems, automized, uh, supporting us um, in, uh, in finding the patterns that predict adverse events and bad outcomes and the, the, of all kinds. And these bad outcomes 
uh, are certainly injuries in healthcare that we want to avoid falls and, and also pressure ulcers and, and infections and all that but also um, uh, patient care that is suboptimal and, and that is, uh, that can be found anywhere so so uh, a systematic and uh, healthcare system wide uh, monitoring or even a quality assurance unit that alerts the management uh, where th uh, that some trajectories are pointing in the wrong direction, but also on the individual level uh, to support the nurse or, or, or the, uh, the doctor saying, hey, you think a little bit more about this. Uh, and uh, in a farther future where it, the re regulatory framework has been developed enough, you can always also maybe let these um, this support systems also act on that information and 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 hence reducing the number of working hours uh, making hopefully nurses and doctors come home earlier to their children thanks um, uh, where are we right now I mean uh, are you are we? at the forefront of this digital healthcare, information-driven healthcare, or can you actually get more advanced, more holistic, digitally AI-ready healthcare elsewhere in the world? Well, I would say we uh, in this room today uh, are working on cutting edge uh, cases, uh, definitely from a, in a European perspective. There are some very uh, good competition in the U.S. Uh, and in and, and forward-leaning healthcare systems today, but but I know that, uh, that should not like be regarded as a problem. It should be regarded as an inspiration because they are often um, uh, happy to share, and as we are, uh, and and we are all in this to to bring better healthcare to patients and and. And so this community is, is often very open-minded and ready to, to, to uh, share and spread and scale uh, good ideas. So, so um, being, br bringing ecosystems where that is e readily done and easily, easy to do is, is one of the things that Vinova is actually uh, investing in right now, um, building these uh, this ease of communication and collaboration. And I, I think that's a really important way forward. I think that's a super important message. I mean, I agree with what I think you're saying. Being best is not a goal in itself. And if you're not the best, you can learn from the best and get there, get to the same point faster. And there's probably, uh, there's probably clinics and research labs in China that are better at certain things and in the US at certain things. And and they need help from us in other areas. And if we collaborate rather than competing for being best, then we can all get ahead faster. So I think that's super important. Um, <clears throat> another question from Justin uh, Talgrenska is that AI skills and AI expertise are in high demand and difficult to find. Uh, how, 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 do you get, how do you solve that problem if you don't have access to AI experts? Well, we solved that problem by training new ones ourselves, actually. We have an academia, an institution uh, at the university where we train uh, data, data scientists, but not all can do that. But I would like to add that you cannot start at the level of AI. You need to do a, a large number of things first. Uh, if you don't have uh, the data in place, AI has no value. Uh, if you don't know what to use AI for, then it has no value. So uh, if you don't know how to collaborate across domains, you don't have that culture, AI has no value. So don't, I have, I sometimes get questioned how we want to start our uh, AI journey uh, and how, how, how do we do that? And I often ask for very basic hygiene factors, like do you speak with each other? Uh, 
Do you have a data warehouse? Have you heard about Python? Uh, so very, very basic uh, uh, questions when it comes to healthcare <laughs> systems wanting to start their AI journey. So uh, yeah. do, don't jump to conclusions, start where you are. Yeah, I think this ties back to what you said earlier, the management needs to take responsibility of this. And I think a lot of big Swedish private companies have taken the shortcut of hiring, hiring a data scientist and putting the responsibility on them to lead that journey. And so they don't have to take the responsibility. And we see a, a lot of big Swedish companies now having spent three years on projects that are super interesting from publishing paper perspective, but not actually changing the organization itself. So it or, can, yeah. or the management tells the IT department to start using AI. Yeah and nothing happens. So, uh, well, they're super happy about that, uh, that task, but the translation into value uh, does not happen that way. So, so um, yeah. And I would like to demystify <coughs> the AI bit. It's not that hard to train an AI model and deploy it. I trained and deployed a deep learning language model yesterday in less than an hour. The data infrastructure is much harder and I would say understanding the business value and the culture change is exponentially harder. That's the hardest bit of all. And actually that has changed over time because five years ago when we started deploying AI, the AI part was super hard, yeah. uh, at least for us. Uh, now there are so readily available tools and also understanding AI, uh, makes you realize that it's an array of tools where there are very simple ones, understandable, transparent, explainable ones, but there are also OPAC models. Uh, and you don't need to go for uh, deep neural networks, investing in, in like uh, GPUs for millions. That's not where you start. Uh, you start with the stuff that you understand and then you build um, gradually on your on the complexity uh, and, and and you need you need to have that understanding not only with yourself or in the IT department but in all stakeholders uh, and to feel safe because one criticism uh, or two uh, on AI is the opacity so we don't understand why things happen or why we got this alert or, or what is the cause and effect here? Uh, and also the hype around uh, AI. But we, um, we at least in our environment has gotten past the hype uh, peak of the hype cycle. Uh, and now it's more down to the hard stuff, uh, like the core uh, of actually getting things done. And that's, that's harder than than deploying uh, a readily available model that you can download from, from a, a open site today. I'm gonna to ask a question related to that, a concrete question and then followed by a scary question. Uh, the concrete question is <clears throat> now when you're working with on your AI journey or your information driven healthcare journey, are you setting concrete goals like 12 months from now, we want to be able to achieve this. So um, I would like to say yes. Uh, well, or actually, yes, we set goals, but yeah. we never reach them. We never reach exactly that goal or exactly at that time. So, and I think uh, one important thing here is to, to be humble. Uh, you always run into obstacles that you did not know existed. Uh, so uh, building trust in, in development, like knowing where you want to go, you want to uh, improve health, uh, increase lifespans and in increase safety. That's like measurable stuff. Uh, but how to get there is not that clear. And, and if you if you put very specific goals, um, there is a large risk 
that you miss the value of the journey because the, uh, we are uh, the, these journeys are learning journeys and you you learn so much along the way that is may, might be more important than the goal in itself so uh, the ecosystem that we built uh, with legal framework regulatory framework and and, and hardware infrastructure and, and skills, et cetera, it came up, it evolved based on a number of case projects where we understood gradually what we needed to do. And we didn't reach in, in every case the goal we set out, but we increased value much more than we expected uh, and before we started uh, the the case or the process itself. So, and realizing that you need to be uh, an eclectic thinker, uh, a exploratory researcher, and an iterative um, analyst uh, is, is, that's not the way we usually work in public funded healthcare in brick wall buildings. Uh, so, uh, humility and humbleness is is like very important going forward. And saying "I'm sorry, this didn't work" is also a very good phrase to train. Yeah, I think that's really, really a good message. I think that goes back to what we discussed earlier. I mean, uh, my takeaway from that is we need to set goals, but it's okay when they change because they often, always change they because always reality change. changes. So, and every prerequisite change so, and, and the surrounding world change so so we are who said panther ray that's like you can never step in the same river twice uh, and, and that's kind of the environment we're working in and uh, technology develops our minds do not but everything else does uh, I'm gonna ask a concrete question about data and regulatory frameworks. And Ulrika, you'll have to just step in when once you want to take over and ask your transitionary question. But I mean, I measure my, I mean, we both have Garmin watches and measure our pulse every day. I have a DNA test online that I can access. I measure my metabolism every morning. When, oh, weird, can, I, <laughs> <laughs> when can I start transacting that data with healthcare and will Will that happen at the same time in all of Sweden, or will I be able to do it with Hall Region Holland first? And oh, you're welcome to to start paying taxes in Region Holland. But uh, so there, uh, what you're speaking about is actually locked in data, and there are so many ways that data is being locked in. There is the data infrastructure, the, how it's how it's stored, and there is no um, standards that are are decided upon nationally today that are good enough. The other one is the regulatory locked-in syndromes. And, and then there is the uh, prestige. There is uh, invented by me uh, locked-in uh, um, problems. And we need to address all those in order to uh, let your uh, heart rate variability inform your future medication when when your angina uh, is is approaching your your coronary vessels so um, but it will happen gradually and and what would push it the most is actually patients asking for it yeah. uh, and telling politicians and, and clinicians that this is what we want to have done uh, and and that will push development forward. This is this is why we go to work. But in order for patients to ask for it, they need to understand what can that be it done. actually can be done uh, yeah. and 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 what it could lead to. But I think that uh, realization and that insight is is growing in society because we're getting more and more used to utilizing information uh, for different purposes and why not your own health? Maybe the most important perspective of your life. Yeah, I think that's a good, another perspective. I mean, in, in the book, we have an illustration about Amazon, all the different services and the patient, they don't consider 
healthcare as only the public sector. It's everything you get. It's your Apple Watch, it's your Garmin, it's everything. And you, you want to be able to use it together and preferably give that data and get help from the top experts that are educated. And information blocking is one of the major issues of the fragmentation of, of, uh, of the healthcare ecosystem with, with this kind of wide definition that you just provided us. And, and, but we need to bridge it to, to reach further. Okay, before I leave over to Ulrika, I want to just, uh, and I'll let you give some final like takeaways or messages i want to ask everyone who's listening please share uh, the information about the book to your networks it's super important that we share the understanding and knowledge about information driven healthcare uh, and marcus any any what's the top thing we missed in this short conversation well 380 pages in in, in the book uh compared to 30 minutes of talk, there's uh, certainly a difference in, in information uh, uh, amount. But I would say that uh, start digging into the subject, uh, commit to what you want to have done and, and don't wait with uh, the start. There's nothing to wait for. Uh, the train is, is leaving the station or it already has left the station, but there's still time to get on it. Don't start with the AI level. That's where you reach once you have a number of hygiene factors in place already. And don't forget the culture. Good. Very good. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, I'm going to leave let you take over, Ulrika. Well, Thank you very much, both Marcus and Kai, for this interesting conversation and dialogue. And you will now get a chance to also see the famous book, the handbook. Uh, Jessica will share a picture of it. it. It's available for ordering, I think, from the AI Sweden website. And I think Jamie shared a link for the real launch event. So like I said, this was a sneak peek. And you also, we also touched upon data access and ownership and in a way, and, and we will have another webinar later this year together with the sister project, uh, Information Driven Care, where this book is one of the major pro products or outcomes from. And there we will look more at the legal mapping and the processes you need to have in place, etc. And so that we will come back with later. But maybe this handbook is not a fairy tale, for sure not but it could maybe provide the tools to face the boogeyman as referred to in the chat. So I had, think we have some additional questions that we will pick up later in the panel. And I think we can, I have one maybe last questions for Kai and we have touched upon it briefly with Kai and Marcus before we move on. And that is, we, is there a need to do a tour. I mean, you guys, especially you, Marcus, are touring quite a lot on this theme and having many lectures and presentations. Do you see any need for doing that in any other countries, such as to collaborate in the Nordic region? What's your view on that? Well, time, time is the limit basically and and during the last year traveling has not been a, an option uh, physically but but digitally in indeed uh, and um, there needs to be more people spreading the message uh, and also across national borders uh, we have uh, intimate contact with with uh, other nordics uh, nordic countries and and there are brilliant thinkers and doers in Finland and Norway and, and Denmark and uh, go there still with pride or rather share. Uh, but um, there are definitely the same challenges to be met in basically all of Western uh, healthcare systems. Uh, and in, in, in the US, the prerequisites are a bit different, but the challenges are often the same. Uh, and and in definitely in other European countries. So, uh, but we need to start somewhere. And we started not to sell anything, but to improve the healthcare around us. That was what we 
we're set to do. Uh, and but hopefully we can share the insights uh, to to solve a number of problems for for others too. And we're happy to listen to other super smart ideas that appear everywhere in, in, in healthcare. Thank you, Marcus. And Kai, one last question for you. Um, as you work in, in applied artificial intelligence and advising in many different industrial sectors, is there particular learnings in addition to the start with health data and then go with the AI crunching? Is there anything more you would like to this audience to take with them? That yeah, I think you, from other sectors. Yeah, I think, I mean, one thing Marcus touched upon is that the leadership and the culture change is really, really difficult and you need the right people to drive this and but it's fine once you get into it. But you one uh, set of asked an important question in the chat and that is around how important is the AI? Um, because a lot of people like expect that we will see completely new things once we run the AI models. But I think the biggest value we get from start is that we remove opinions we get facts that we can collaborate around and that we shouldn't underestimate the value of that because then we we don't have to be afraid of losing face or whatever you want to call it depending on culture so thank you very much marcus and kai i think we should move on with the agenda let's have a very short leg stretcher get a cup of tea a cup of coffee whatever you prefer and let's be back in one or two minutes, and then we will continue. Okay. Very welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a chance to do that 
small break, fill up with some energy. So now we switch focus to some extent and we will instead learn more about the project, Swedish Medical Language Data Lab, and more some details from the project. Swedish Medical Language Data Lab was set out in January 2020 to do some edge crunching and model training using the AI Sweden Edge Lab at Lincoln Science Park. But things not always uh, proceed according to plan. In Sweden, as we briefly touched upon, the legal headroom for moving around sensitive data is very limited. And we therefore had to change focus and started working on a local access approach instead. So if the data couldn't reach the experts, the AI experts instead had to reach the data. But how do you do that in the middle of a pandemic when no visitors are allowed to even enter a hospital? The project team went back to the drawing table and to do things differently. And with a local access approach, now both Region Västra Götaland and Region Halland have established ways of letting third parties, such as AI experts, researchers, or industry, for that matter, access to patient data in a controlled way. It took a couple of servers, new servers, graphic processing units, risk analysis or data privacy impact assessments, as the privacy people refer to them, several weeks of manual annotating of data sets by clinicians, data washing or cleansing, a couple of layers of agreements and new assignments and new login credentials. So we learned from the previous speakers, like Kai said, he trained the model yesterday. Here we just struggled with the access in an ethical and legal way, but we made it. And our experts are now able to train models directly on patient data, such as for hospital acquired conditions like patient falls, which is really cumbersome and costly. What if it is even possible to do predictions such as for patient falls in, to prevent them in the first place? Our next speakers are Michael Sagan, AI expert and research engineer with the leading applied AI company Poltarion, and Olof Mogren, senior research scientist. Oh my gosh, we just went dark in the room. Uh, at Rice Research Institute, where he's heading the deep learning research group. So we have to do some waving to maybe turn the lights on again. If you're interested in keeping up with the recent deep learning development, Olaf is the one to follow. Marcus and Olaf will now guide you through, through some recent exciting results from various model trainings, verifications and comparisons on patient data. The real thing. Welcome on stage, Olaf and Marcus. Thank you very much for that introduction. I will start. We cannot hear you, Marcus. You're muted. Your mic is on now, Marcus, but we still can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Confirm. Okay. Then I will start by sharing. You're muted again. I think your sound is off once you start sharing, Marcus. If you could send the slides to any, send them to me, I can try to, or Jessica, send them to Jessica and she can try to share them. And you can just do the talking. Or if Olaf, do you have access to the slides? Uh, not those slides, no. Okay. Pass them on to Jessica and we try our best from here. And then you can just do the talking and let us know when to flip. We have some heavy rains here in Gothenburg today, so it felt like we will have a flood coming in through the window soon. And then there was a light going out. Uh, 
always some excitement in life, right? So thank you guys for waiting. I hope to soon be back on track. Would it be possible to change order so all of you go ahead instead instead or would that screw things up or it it would but but i think there's uh, there's a story here so i think it's it's better if if marcus can start and let's um, be patient of course i can i can give some some background if you like um or marcus you can start giving some background before the slides come up please feel free to i think we just got the email but now the email scanning service has to do its work oh. before it can share it. Yeah. Ah, here you go. I, can, I think I can share it soon. What kind of virus did you embed in your slides, Marcus? <laughs> it must be very high tech. So let's see. You're still uh, muted, by the way. And we still cannot hear you. Yeah. I will start sharing screen. And there we go. Off we go. There are some sound settings on the beside the mute microphone icon in Zoom. Can we hear you, Marcus? I think he's leaving and, and rejoining. OK. But so, so what I and Marcus will be talking about is um, um, I just said what we'll, we'll be talking about is, is the data from, from Region Halla. And uh, we have studied three different cases in, in the med Swedish Medical Language Data Lab. And one of them is for, for adverse effects, adverse events. Uh, and that is uh, people who injure themselves from falling uh, during care. Uh, that, that specific event is it's what's being studied here. Uh, Marcus, are you coming back? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. So please, okay. I just I just gave some some background on the data. Well, thank you. Um, seem to be having some technical difficulties, and I apologize for that. Uh, but now it seems to work. Um, this is a uh, overview of the things that we at Baltorum, but also Rice, has been doing on one of the use cases in the uh, SWE, uh, SMS projects and primarily using AI models for adverse event detection, uh, the learnings, uh, the results and the way forward in the project. Uh, we can move to the next slide. So the primary goal of the Swedish Medical Language Data Lab has been to make the medical language data in Swedish more available and develop the technical, legal and ethical processes around this. Because there is so much more than just deploying a AI system uh, and making predictions on the data that you have as Marcus Lingman and Kai described earlier. There's such a vast process before you can actually deploy your AI systems to get the insights that you might want to have from these very deep and sophisticated models. And the uh, further end goal will to be to use these predictive precision-based uh, healthcare models to individually predict for each patient the optimal care that they need and uh, facilitate the resources for doctors so they can uh, allocate their time in a more efficient and uh, practical way. Uh, 
in that sense, we want to use AI to predict when potentially adverse events will happen and improve the decision making and support system for doctors. And in order to use these models in practice, you need to have both interpretable and trusted predictions uh, from your AI models. Next slide. And one of these uh, three use cases that we have in this uh, SMS project is for Region Holland with adverse event uh, predictions, where there's about 110,000 adverse events and with a resulting uh, 1,400 deaths as a result of adverse events per year in Sweden. And the idea is that we have these electronic health records where about 70% of those contain free text of some kind from uh, patient journal texts. And the idea is that we might be able to leverage this free text format uh, along with the, the uh, other um, uh, metrics in the electronic health records to both be able to detect if an uh, adverse event has happened, but also predict them in, in the future. And what we started with was to find uh, previous fall injuries from journal texts where doctors has annotated in their patient, uh, for each patient in the journal, if a fall injury has happened or not. And some of those has then been annotated in to their uh, document, uh, into their um, system, along with the electronic health records, if it is a fall injury or not. But only a handful of these has been annotated. So the system itself cannot be used to fully detect all of these uh, fall injuries. And the reason it was limited from adverse uh, to fall injuries instead of just all adverse events is because we have uh, a more uh, clear understanding on what a fall injury is and how to detect it instead of just saying all adverse events. So it's a way of limiting the scope and to make a more precise and informed uh, model to find those. And the second uh, potentially future use case is that we want to foresee adverse events and train predictive models on the data. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So the approach that we have taken is to investigate the data and then train the models and evaluate these different models on the data. Next slide. So we can see that uh, for Region Holland, we have about 2 million journal texts where about 172,000 of those has been annotated. And out of those annotations, 300 of those were annotated as a patient having had a fall injury. And this means that we have a highly imbalanced data set, which we can see in the next slide where if we just plot the histogram of the labels, the number of patients who has not fallen and the number of patients who has fallen, that you can barely see the number of patients that has fallen from the data set. If, and that means that if we just want to train a model on all of the data, um, deep learning models and machine learning models in general work better the more data you have but it's also important to consider what type of data and how the data is distributed. You want the, the model to learn uh, to detect fall injuries from non-fall injuries. And if we only train the model on the data as it looks currently, the best results the model would achieve is by always guessing that it's not a fall injury. Uh, so what we did uh, then by detecting this is to treat the imbalanced data sets by either reducing the number of uh, patients in the category 
has not fallen by making the uh, number of training examples in both cases about the same or slightly more in the case of not fallen and not just uh, in very um, unevenly distributed. Next slide. We tested several different models. Um, the more simple machine learning based models uh, that are based on bag of words. Uh, the bag of words with a linear classifier, the TFIDF with a random forest classifier and TFIDF with SVC are all bag of words based models. Uh, ways of representing words into a vector by counting the occurrence or frequency of certain words. And by doing a vector representation, the model can then uh, use those features and then classify if it was a fall injury or not. We also tested uh, BERT, uh, which is the KB BERT, a Swedish version of BERT developed by uh, the National Library of Sweden. We next evaluated in the next slide uh, using accuracy, precision, recall, and F1 score, and visualizing this with a confusion matrix and verifying the area under the curve. And finally, we also tested this, uh, these four different models on test data withheld from us um, and provided by Region Halland, uh, which is the true test of the model performance. And in the next slide, uh, we can see some of the results from these models that has been evaluated. Uh, so this is just an example of the results that we got from the models. Uh, and we can see here from the area under the curve and the confusion matrix that the models can classify the number of uh, has not fallen uh, labels very well and also for the number of patients that has fallen. Uh, next slide. And if we want, uh, so as I mentioned before, one of the criteria for using these models in a real world system and having doctors or uh, domain experts rely on this system is to have interpretability. So we also looked at what the model actually learns and if this seems uh, to correspond with what we expect the model to learn. So for when it's predicting fall injuries, it looks at the words uh, fallen on the floor, floor, bed, uh, injuries, etc., uh, which seems to correspond well with what we expect the model to learn as well. And we tested different n-grams or uh, combination of words between just using one word, two words, or up to four words, but found that there was a slight um, uh, preference for using a bigram or two words in combination. And next slide. Next slide. Thanks. Uh, so when we, we have trained these models and evaluated them on the label data set, uh, a subset of the label data set, we compared it on the test data set from 2017. And we could see that the accuracy and recall was quite high for these models, but the position was uh, far worse. And it, for the next slide, uh, we also tested uh, to verify what the true uh, positive, false positive, true negative, and false negative was for these models. Uh, and we can see that out of the uh, total number of expected fall injuries in the test set, which are 290, uh, we can see that the models are quite close to capture, capturing all of them, but not quite. Uh, next slide. And choosing the correct model 
for this type of problem is as uh, in most cases a trade-off between precision and recall where if we look at the true pos positive and false negative we want to minimize the false negative and maximize true positive because we want the model to catch all fall uh, injuries uh, which are the real fall injuries uh, next slide but on the other hand we don't want the model to uh, predict too many uh, potential fall injuries because true positive plus false neg uh, false positives are the number of examples the model predicts are fall injuries and this means that in reality the annotators would need to go through uh, these total number of examples and check manually if this is a fall injury or not so in this case the random forest model which has overall uh, slightly lower true positive might be more uh, usable since it also has a, a lower false positive uh, but again that is something that is a precision recall trade-off and very much dependent on uh, the domain and use case. And we can see here, based on the results, that the quite simple or uh, statistical bag of words model performed very well. Next slide. So some of the conclusions that we have drawn from this is that the simple models based on just representing the words as bag of words are solve the problem quite well and that the key words such as fallen, on the floor, et cetera, that are highly specific for solving uh, this use case where the doctors have annotated the fall injuries beforehand, solved the problem very well. And that might be one of the reasons why these very dense and less um, interpreter models such as BERT uh, fall short. Uh, based on the results that both Rice and Peltarion got by training independent models and achieving the same result, we could see that uh, this seems to hold true and give a better support for these type of models. For uh, model selection, again, this is a uh, trade-off between precision and recall. And uh, again, I want to highlight that uh, AI models are not uh, strictly medical, though they might seem uh, to be medical, that these type of models will only learn to find these, uh, and these uh, um, uh, patterns based on what they are trained on. And in this case, they are trained on uh, journal text where the doctors have uh, written which are fall injuries or not. And if a patient has fallen, they have most likely also written the patient was on the floor and had this type of fall injury. Uh, so we cannot explicitly expect the model to find uh, fall injuries that has not been annotated by the doctors uh, before. Next slide. So, uh, now I will leave it uh, over to Olaf to uh, explain what the road ahead is um, for Region Holland. Thank you, Marcus. Yes, so I'll just share my screen. There, I think we can see my screen now. Um, okay, so so. Marcus just talked about uh, the experiments on on detecting uh, the fall injuries from from health record uh, uh, free text. Uh, so this is data from electronic health records, uh, where most of the data, most of the information is is in free text forms, which is nice because it's searchable and it's suitable for automated analysis. But it's also uh, a bit challenging to to work with this with this text. Um, so, so this is sort of my slide on, on what Marcus just talked about. Uh, the audit uh, perspective of the health, health records. Um, so the model was trained to take one of these, uh, <clears throat> one of these um, 
text snippets from, from the health record uh, from one point of time and to, to uh, predict whether or interpret this, this particular time point, uh, whether there was a fall injury. And in that um, text snippet, there is usually uh, certain words as, as we saw in Marcus's slides, um, where, where the doctor has uh, actually uh, decided that there is, there is a fall injury here. So this is really useful for, for making the audits in, in um, afterwards uh, as to analyze uh, a, a, a time series of, of uh, health records and see how many of these cases did we have, uh, when did they occur, uh, to what people uh, did it occur, what, what, who were the patients and so on. Um, okay, so, so now can we predict the future? Um, and what does it mean to predict the future? Well, um, if we train models similarly on this uh, health record text uh, and, and we train it to make a prediction of something that, that's, that's not happened yet, that means that the, that the model is, is going to look at, if you, if you see this timeline in the bottom of this slide, you see uh, the blue now, uh, and, and then we consider everything to the left to be the history. So Alice has a history here of a number of, of entries in the health records. Um, and we can give this to a model and we can train it to, to, um, to give a risk score of, of what's going to happen in the future. Now, um, now in, for practical reasons, the training data, of course, is history. Uh, but then we virtually set a now time time point, uh, and we uh, and we make a prediction based on the history before that time point, and we have the annotations for the future in that history. That means that we're we're looking into the future by some hours or some days, uh, and we see that there is an annotation uh, hours or days afterwards. Um, and, and we make the predictions. So we're now not, no longer looking at these annotations made by, uh, by the doctors or the, the model is not looking at it. It's, it's training to try to predict that annotation in the future or predict that there will be such, such an event in the future. Um, so so Marcus told us that, that it's, not, it's not magic and, and is it? Um, can we predict the future? And, and in, if so, is that magic? Well, we can predict the future and it's not magic. Um, we cannot predict the future to 100% uh, certainty, uh, but I don't think that's all, either a, a reasonable, reasonable goal here. But we have, have made some, some preliminary uh, experiments on this uh, where we're looking at a history and then we're uh, using the, the future annotations, so it's something that comes after this history, uh, where there either is a fall or there is not a fall um, in the annotated data. And then we train uh, a similarly simple model as, as the ones um, Marcus just mentioned. These are bag of words models with, with a linear classifier afterwards, uh, linear regression. Um, and then we get an accuracy of eight to seven percent. And with the data set split, we have here a random guess, or or majority class guess would be seventy percent. Uh, so we get a, a, a bit above um, random guessing, or quite a bit above uh, eight to seven percent. Uh, we had an area under the curve for for zero point seventy two. You should remember that this is early work. Um, this can be used as a risk estimation. Uh, if we have some annotations for a patient that comes into <clears throat> to a clinic, uh, we can make adjustments in the in the care that well this 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 is a high risk patient we we should take special care uh, perhaps have some more supervision so that this this uh, patient is not falling. Um, we have shown that there is signal in data. We are going to look more into this um, with with some more. Uh, some, some other uh, kinds of representations for, for the data. Uh, and I, I'm sure that we can, we can make this score a bit better. Um, so, so one thing that, that, <clears throat> that can be used in such situations, so this model that, that I just mentioned, it was only looking at the, the free text. Uh, so it, it was looking at, at what the doctors have written 
uh, or nurses have written about this patient in the history, um, but it didn't look at, at any other features uh, about the patients. So uh, other features that, that, that we do have is of course age, gender, um, and and this is just uh, this is just a plot from 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 what the <clears throat> from what the age distribution is in in this particular data set. Uh, so of course uh, patients uh, that that <clears throat> well I'm actually not sure <laughs> if if it's the right right label on this. I thought uh, older people uh, fell more. Uh, anyway. Uh, there is some some predictive signal in this data as well, and it it should it should actually um, be used. Uh, and and uh, uh, we're also thinking of in, incorporating medication and, and and stuff like that into that prediction. Um, so there is signal there, um, as we have also seen in 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 the discussion earlier today. Uh, the data readiness is very important when you're when you are starting such such a journey. Training model, uh, I agree with previous speakers here. It's not super challenging. You, though, you need to sort of have uh, your data in the right places, and and you need to know what you're looking for in the data, and and you need to have the data in reasonable formats and with the right kinds of annotations. Um. So that was my update to this. Thank you very much. This was in collaboration with me, my, my group members, uh, especially Edwin. Thank you very much, Marcus and Olaf. So I have a few questions for you before we move on. And that is, looking at you, Marcus, um, what are the major learnings so far for you in this Swedish Medical Language Data Lab project? Uh, great question. Um, so maybe not uh, new learnings per se, but always interesting to verify and uh, get your remind yourself of that uh, having a baseline model or a simpler model to compare against with more advanced models is always advantageous. And just using very deep models might not necessarily give you better results than using more traditional models. And that it uh, always depends on the type of problem that you want to solve, that simpler models might be better or dense models might be better. Uh, we've also um, learned that uh, for, TFI, for these bag of words models, uh, even though they are supposedly uh, much better for very long text segments, they all also work very well on very short texts. Thank you. I think all of you wanted to add something there. Can I add a little comment? Yes, because there was also a question in the in the chat earlier, uh, and I don't remember the, the exact question, but it, it was something along the lines of, of traditional statistical approaches uh, versus uh, modern machine learning and and whether or not uh, uh, we should use one or the other and and I would say that, that we should also always use the, the 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 right one for the task and when the task is to translate language uh, we need uh, like from one language to another we need we need a high abstraction level and that is possible to do with deep learning models. Um, now, what Marcus and I have been talking about here, we have we have we're, we're somewhere in 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 between here. Uh, so these these can be seen as as not deep. Uh, they can they can be seen as as neural networks, but but shallow. Um, and and then we have statistical methods that are perhaps even one step simpler. And Occam's Razor, you should always use the simplest one uh, that solves the task. Um, and for these, these uh, for these problems, these seem to be the right kinds of models. Thank you for elaborating on that, Olaf. And also, I understand that from a legislative perspective, it's advantageous to go with the simpler models because they are more transparent and they don't they're stable. They don't really change over time. So there is also an advantage with these kind of models. And going back to you again, Olaf, um, I know you specialize in applied, applied AI focusing on privacy, fairness, and efficiency. 
could you reflect upon this project from that specific angle? Sure. Uh, so, so we've we've been talking a lot about uh, about privacy in this project, and we've been talking a lot about about the, the the legal perspectives of that. What data can we use, and when can we use it, and how can we use it? Uh, can we move the data? Uh, can we move uh, models that are trained on this data? Uh, we actually wrote a report together with Max um, uh, Law Firm and and AI Sweden on the legal. Uh, aspects of moving trained models um, and 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 sort of the relationship to GDPR there. Um, the the sort of the the, the fairness aspects uh, should also always be be considered when you're training models like these. Uh, what is it that that the model is reacting to? And and that's of course also where where the the explainability and and the transparency is is important. Is the model reacting to to uh, to things that 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 sort of shouldn't uh, underlie a, such a decision, or or does it actually show that that things that we didn't think um, was the reason for for this kind of of a signal? Um, then then we need to think about that. It's it's not the case that we should ignore signals that that are perhaps based on on gender or or race, uh, but but we need. To think about when when such such signals make it through. Okay, thank you, Olaf. Um, with that said, it's been tricky, like we talked about before, and we will also be able to present more through our sister project on how you do to really make sure you have secure access in terms of data. But that has the potential to really help industry um, to get data access as well. But we will come back to that in later webinars. So thank you very much, Marcus and Olaf. And we are now preparing to have some questions for the chat. We have some questions already. And I think Kai is trying to post something. Let's see if it works now. Anyone successful in opening the link? Um, so Jessica, do you have any questions from the chat for our speakers? We do. Uh, the first question is, um, I guess, more to Marcus Lingman and Kai. And that is, um, often it seems that the data ownership is the key barrier to development. What are your views on that? And also another question in relation to that is, how much is that a real barrier and not just a barrier that gets too much used as a boogeyman? Uh, so I would say data ownership is something that needs to be addressed but uh, in terms of uh, locked in data uh, rather than ownership perspective I'm sure that uh, healthcare would love to share data uh, for development and patient safety uh, modeling etc as we are doing but it's it is super sensitive data so and there are uh, there are a number of regulations that we need to uh, be compliant with. So that's finding ways of how to not lock in data in a legal way uh, is is key to to progress. And and that's one of the working areas we we have uh, had in this. Uh, uh, in this project, understanding how this can be done technically, uh, legally, uh, etc. So, uh, locking in data is is, is uh, certainly a, an obstacle, but there are reasons why data is locked in. Uh, so, you need just need to tackle those reasons. Thank you for that answer. Uh, and the next question is related to the link or screenshot that Kai uploaded in the chat. Uh, I'm not sure if you want to add anything to that, Kai. Uh, what was the question? Exactly what it is, what it was, because we people failed to uh, open it. Oh, yeah, uh, there, was a, there was a comment from uh, you one around, do we really need AI or... Uh, can we just use this, use simpler techniques? And I think <clears throat> the visualization shows that if you strive for AI, i.e. 
uh, getting or understanding and seeing patterns that we not can't and can't explain the logics behind, but we trust that they exist and can act upon, then on that on the way towards that, we we get other benefits. So even if you strive for deep learning and advanced AI techniques, that will demand that you put your data infrastructure in place and you're, you make a change in culture. And then you might use other techniques to analyze that data and work with that data on the way. But I think AI is a good aspiration that forces you in the right direction. Because if you only use feature-based techniques or rule-based techniques, you can actually get away with not having a proper data infrastructure. You don't have to make that culture change properly. The same way that old legacy companies, they have a website and they have an e-commerce, but they still function the same way that, pre that they did pre-internet. Thank you. Uh, we got another question here in the chat. Let's see. Healthcare is a highly uh, hierarchical environment and people on all levels may have fairly strong opinions on how things should be done. Do you think initiatives for how to change the workflows and practices based on data should happen top down or bottom up? Who dare to answer no that? No one. <laughs> <laughs> All of the above is my answer. Horizontally, top down, bottom up, inside out, outside in. Uh, there is not no one way forward uh, here. So the important thing is that um, the, way, uh, the way forward is oriented in the direction where value is created. And, and that direction can be pointed out from several stakeholders, but managerial levels has a number of needs that need to be solved uh, or, or addressed and, and clinicians have others uh, and, uh, and data can be used for so many purposes. So you, you cannot like do it either one way or the other. And I can add, as, as a layman, I can take the freedom to, to speak uh, more harsh. And I, I think also, I mean, as, as Marcus says, managers and the organization have a big responsibility, but, but I also think the educators have a big responsibility in educating a workforce that thinks differently. It's probably shared responsibility that goes through many sectors, right? Yeah. Thank you. We do have a follow-up question regarding data ownership and looking in data for security reason is important. Uh, but the question was about the view of the patient owning his or her data. All right, it seems that I, I should uh, capture that too. Uh, well, uh, it depends on, on the task. So uh, according to Swedish law, uh, data that is produced within uh, public health care is actually owned by public health care, and we cannot even throw it away if we wish. So in that sense, uh, we are obliged to make it as accessible to patients, but we are also uh, in a regulatory framework where we are supposed to use that data in order to improve patient safety, patient healthcare quality. So there are two sides to that coin. Then there are, uh, there are uh, data that are produced outside uh, the health, healthcare system that is clearly owned by uh, Kai or his Garmin watch maybe. But um, so that's a, a completely different logic. And sometimes we mix those two up uh, and there are, uh, uh, there is an international discourse on this topic, also in, in, in uh, legal areas, if, if you as a patient or individual rather, should be the one owning and carrying your data with you when you travel through uh, the healthcare system or, or your life, 
Um, that is not the situation today. Uh, maybe we end up there uh, one day, but that's not an option uh, according to, to what we need to fulfill based on the regulations that we are subject to at the moment. In my opinion, that is probably that we need to have that discussion in Sweden. What are the pros and cons if we, if we make the transition or with the current system? Because it's currently it's hard to make a transaction because of the structures of the data ownership, but we can't just make a complete shift without looking at the, the cons. Thank you very much. Do we have additional questions? Uh, no. So if you have any more questions, please write them in the chat. Or if we missed a question, please rewrite it. So I have a question in the meanwhile. That is maybe, yeah, it's towards Marcus and Lingman. And it's about, we have had quality registers in Sweden, nationally and regionally, for many years. So to follow up on surgical procedures and effectiveness more on a population level. And now we've shown some examples how third parties, like you said, can get access to data to improve quality within a certain healthcare unit, etc. These are good steps on the way, but we shouldn't we should aim for more, right, on a national level, or would you like to reflect on that? Sure. So there is often a discussion on, on the national registries and we're very proud of them in Sweden and they are used uh, a lot for different purposes, uh, the, uh, but there are also limitations. So national registries are often uh, uh, domain oriented or subject oriented. Uh, they are often deep but narrow data. So there's a lot of data, but on very few variables or, or parameters in relation to what we have in healthcare. We'll have, uh, I mean, we developed one model where we predicted who would be readmitted to hospital after having been discharged and, and that happening within 30 days, something that we are deeply interested in. And that model used 1,072 variables or parameters to come up with an accuracy or an area on the, the curve of, of 92%. So, and that could never happen in any registry because the, the number of parameters in, in every single registry uh, is, is, uh, um, too few. Uh, there is too a non-holistic uh, view of, of the patient. But on the other hand, the quality in the uh, registry data is often very, very good. So what could be done there should be done there, but you uh, might want to reach farther if you want to uh, have a more holistic uh, view of, of, of the patient. And often, patients are willing uh, to, or even eager to have their data used for purposes that improve their care. And, and, but unfortunately at this point, we don't have a system in Sweden where they can in a safe and controlled way uh, put their data into use in this way on, on, a, uh, on a larger scale, I hope that will come about in the near future uh, where where patient can donate their data for research or, 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 or development for their own good, but also for their the good of their peers. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marcus. So you can summarize that the quality registers, they have served us well in Sweden, but they won't take us all the way. We probably need to embark on another journey nationally to get further. Thank you. I think we have some more chat questions again. We do. Do the panelists have a favorite up and coming method or application area of AI in terms of healthcare? What should we be most excited about? Great question, Julia. Maybe I can start. Um, so from the perspective of usability, I think that the tabular uh, type of models that we see uh, popping up more and more that are on par with uh, 
more machine learning based models. So model AI models that are uh, dense in terms of BERT or similar uh, uh, transformer based models that work on tabular data are really interesting because most of the data that we have in, out in practice seem to be either in tabular format or can be representative uh, as tabular data. So having a model that can act on this in a tabular sense and work with categorical features and text is a really interesting prospect, I think. And also having models that work, uh, that are less insensitive to spelling mistakes, uh, that can work more on the actual handwriting or um, mistyping of a doctor. So not just uh, exactly perfectly worded Swedish language is also really interesting, I think. Uh, models in the lines of byte encoding models or uh, models that uh, yeah, can reduce the sensitivity to noise. And also the increasing progress of using one and the same model for all types of modalities. So one model that works without uh, any need to configure the model uh, that can work on both text, images, uh, numerical data, etc. Uh, that I think will be uh, increasing focus uh, moving forward in this research space. Perhaps I can add a few words there. Um, I agree with what Marcus says, and I think it's exciting with, with models that, that merge different kinds of data. Uh, but for people uh, who haven't studied machine learning, uh, we need to make it clear that, that, that these, having a model that, that can work on different data is one thing, and having one model that will solve everything is another thing. And that is in, in uh, that is probably impossible. Uh, so we cannot have one model that, that, that solves every problem in, in AI. And, and, and this is not, I'm not objecting to what Marcus says here because everything that Marcus says was, was true. And thinking about all these, these particular things uh, like, like the byte pair encodings and stuff like that, those are things that we need to do to, to find the models that work for the particular tasks that, that we're doing. And that also sort of um, connects with, with a question we had before about organizations. I, I think we, we need we need projects like exactly this one where we have uh, we have um, the the the, uh, the problem owners and we have the experts and we're, and we're start talking and and we need to have that discussion and we need to have the ideas from from the problem own, owner people and and the solution owners. Uh, we're nothing without the interesting problems and we're not nothing without the discussion about them because we need to uh, develop the models and develop the, the algorithms so that they work for these, these particular tasks. And, and again, the, the problem owners need to sort of uh, start thinking about, about their data and, and, and about what, how can we use this in, in the modeling. And that, that's where sort of our input uh, is, could be valuable for, for for you guys, we need to connect from different uh, different uh, angles. Thank you for. I wholeheartedly idea. concur right. that, that though the AI aspect is interesting and the technical aspects of what you could potentially do is just one very small part of the larger uh, pipeline. And having the domain expert, the data, the legal requirements to access it is often more important uh, and yeah, having that collaboration is much more important than just uh, the latest and greatest in AI. Thank you. I guess one other aspect to our value here would be to really cleanse or wash the data because we're talking about very sensitive data and if there are tags so that it can be tied to a certain person, I mean, that's really bad, but really good data washing, data cleansing techniques, taking us beyond name recognition 
I think that would be really awesome, something that could be deployed in healthcare. Do you have any, Kai, you wrote in the chat about a good example already in real life in India about mobile phones with IR cameras and models. Uh, all ages, non-invasive. That sounds super smart. And I think we have another example quite nearby here, Gnosko, uh, where you can have your birthmarks checked. It's an AI algorithm to define whether there is risk of skin cancer or not. So we're getting there. Some really sm good startups working with good techniques that can improve healthcare substantially. Sybase as well, thank you. Any, Marcus uh, Lingman, anything you would like to add in terms of usage area where you see great potential for this technique? Well, the question in the chat was actually, what should we be most excited about? And I have a hard, hard time being getting excited about data curation actually i'm sorry but but that uh what i what drives me is meaning and value creation and what ai uh, can provide and help with is actually uh risk prediction in time where we can prevent things from happening that we don't want to happen to patients. So that's the most exciting area that I can see. Uh, and that is part of precision healthcare, individualized healthcare for real, uh, based on facts, based on the data provided. And, and data combined with co competencies combined with, with uh, toolboxes like AI, but also simpler models uh, will help us get there. So, so that's what is most exciting to me. More examples in the chat. Thank you very much. I think we touched on all the technical opportunities and challenges as well as where we can do most impact with this type of technology. To me, that I think Marcus's point was the most important one, that preventive and personalized version. That's why I mentioned Sybase, which is screening for atopic dermatitis. If you can do that when children are born and detect deviances in the skin barrier, then we can help them not develop eczema or asthma. That would Instead be, of waiting really until they're 20. Prevent and prescribe, and yes, instead of treat. Thank you very much. Um, it seems like we are running out of questions in the chat, Jessica. So thank you all for listening and your contributions in the chat channel. In the project, we have a few more months to go. So please stay tuned for additional webinars and updates. You can follow us on Salvianska Science Park LinkedIn address. And if you want to learn more about considerations around third party access to medical data and initial results from training and testing, more on transformer models, you can check out a recorded version of our previous webinar, which we sent in June. It's also available on our website, Salvianska Science Park.se. And even better, if you find this topic interesting and want to learn more about health and medical data usage, sign up for this year's park annual event on 7th October. It will be held as a digital meeting and you will have full access to the material also afterwards. There you will be able to listen to Marcus again on the perspective of health data, Jona Pilkes from Chito Every, Marianne Pilgård, Trial Nation, and Pia de Remen, Boneprox, one of our startup companies in the environment of Sargenska Science Park, as well as Ebba Josefsson Lindqvist. AI Sweden. We will send out the presentations in a couple of days and the recording and other materials will be available also from our website. Any last questions from any from the panel or any other? Nothing in the chat, right? No, then I would like to say thank you to our speakers and thank you very much to all our listeners and participants. And thank you to Jessica for helping me today. Thank you. So thank you very much and goodbye. Take care, everyone.